Uh, today's session on spiritual conversations is hearing voices, psychosis or spiritual. And I chose this topic because the month of October is dedicated to mental health, mental wellness. And in spiritual conversations, I tried to look for something that has a, a, a combined focus of mental health, mental wellness or mental illness, however you want to look at it, and spirituality. And often it is hearing voices that is raised as being of a spiritual dimension or of a psychotic dimension. So it may be, um, so it ties in with mental illness, if you like, given that psychosis is generally framed in the terms of mental illness. So I posed the question and I noticed a few people got on board early in the piece. So I thought that they were drawn to this topic for probably personal reasons. They've had some personal involvement in hearing voices or they work with others that they care for in hearing voices. I'm not sure that uh, the ordinary person in the street is drawn to such a topic. <laughs> it's not like um, how to surf the waves in Byron Bay, <laughs> which is the area I'm at at the moment. <laughs> and I know that would draw so much interest from the general public. But this is quite a specific focus and I recognise that. And so I do think that it would draw people who have that dedicated interest in hearing voices. So in, in approaching the question to begin with, um, I'll ask you, Vin, what are your thoughts or conceptualizations around the topic or around the, um, the whole concept of hearing voices? Well, when I first saw the title, I thought this is, um, I thought about it from a spiritual perspective, first of all. And I thought, you know, often people say that they can hear uh, voices and, you know, there's a, that line from the, from some fam famous movie, I can't remember the title of, where um, they say, I speak, I hear dead people or something like that. Yeah. And, you know, often, you know, um, spirit mediums talk uh, sort of act as a bridge to to the, the the people who have departed, and that they can pass messages back and forth between the living and the dead. And so that's what I was thinking of when when you when I saw the title. But then I thought, well, then I started looking at the hashtag "Voices in My Head," and I saw that there were mostly um, people who were um, suffering from severe depression. Uh, had had suicidal thoughts yeah. and um, were quite seriously uh, suffering uh, from um, a mental illness. And, you know, it may be quite uh, wary or, or sensitive to the topic, whereas I was sort of jumping in uh, head first, I thought, well, gee, um, this, is, this is actually a very serious topic, uh, not one to, to really be taken lightly. Mm. Yeah, and I've, I've had some experience in working with people who have heard voices and it's been very, very interesting and the family members have been on board as being so concerned. And I'll just tell you about one person in, in particular that comes to mind and this person, and it, it could be, you know, any person anywhere because it is a reasonably common example, I believe, of people hearing voices. So the, this person had a psychotic episode um, someplace and caused him to be going down the streets at night and uh, being delusional and then grandiose and claiming 
um, that he was seeing things, seeing people, seeing the dead, hearing the dead. And of course, people viewed that as being bizarre and definitely psychotic. And so this man was sectioned. He was picked up by the police and he was admitted to a mental um, area of a hospital in the, men the mental ward. And his family visited him and he still claimed that this experience was very real and he was being heavily medicated. And then when he was heavily medicated, he was realizing that this, this is not a good position to be in. He felt that he was losing all sense of any dimensions that he had. And he was living in a, a, a vague, area and so he actually found a way to discharge himself he escaped <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and he went into hiding because he didn't want to be found and be readmitted and so after a while he made his way back to the family who kept him in hiding and uh, he took some time to recover uh, or to become familiar with the experience and to become more comfortable with the experience. When I got to see him and the family, they were absolutely convinced that it was a spiritual episode. He believes that it was a turning point. It was a time in his life that he came face to face with demons, if you like, and he was put in a dimension that put him to viewing his life in a totally different way. Now, this man is now an amazing um, entrepreneur and has started a business and is a fitness fanatic and a health coach and is what I would regard as a very together young man. And I, I totally believe and have faith in the reality of, of his experience as being of a spiritual dimension. And who knows what would have happened if he remained in that institution. Hey, <laughs> good to have you here. Hi. Hi. Hey, lovely to have you here, Wendy. Thank you. Raymond. I enjoyed the conversation last time. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, lovely to have you, you here. As so, you were talking, I was thinking, I don't know what I have to contribute to the conversation necessarily, other than it's interesting. And, um, when you were talking, it was reminding me of an article I'd read about shamanism and how shamans actually view mental illness as as this, you know, a gateway to spirit, like just exactly what you described. And sometimes those first psychic experiences people have, they don't know how to embody them. They don't know how to handle them. So it could appear to be a little crazy, but in reality, it's just, it, the expansion is so big and so fast and people don't know how to handle it. And then they eventually evolve to handle it. So I think the shaman perspective is pretty interesting on this, but I don't know a lot about it. Yeah. Fantastic, Wendy. That's a lovely perspective to come up with. And even though you claim not to know too much about the topic, I, I think the benefit of people jumping in and being prepared to discuss a topic like this hmm. actually puts it on the table to have a greater understanding around the topic for people who are not necessarily 
um, professionally involved in this field or have a dedicated interest of a personal or friend nature. So I think it broadens the perspective of bringing, you know, this, you know, peculiarity as it's regarded um, to the table and to the fore where people may, may not feel so isolated or so persecuted or so demonised, whatever the perspective may, they may feel that the general public may have of their experience. So right. thanks for jumping on board. Well, thank you for creating such great topics. <laughs> and Raymond, you're we're we're buddies, we're neighbours at the moment. <laughs> yeah, just, just a, an hour and a half down the road or something. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, look, I, I, I um, it's funny because it's, it's one that I kind of tend to to steer away from in general, only because there's so many connotations and things that people um, bring up with it, and. The, you know, there's some some people are, are not really open to the idea of of entities or of uh, of energy from other realities or any sort of um, things of that nature. Yet, I have had um, dealings with working with people that have that have um, um, uh, such you know sorts of things. And one one of the things that we used to do in the work that I was heavily involved with was we used to always um, say that anything that sort of doesn't feel like you pretty much isn't you. Um, and, you know, when you're when you're working from, you know, your true beingness and when you're growing, then, you know, that you know that's um, that the, you can get a basic core um, feeling of who you are and then anything else you, you can recognise as something else. Now, uh, something, you know, when, you, when we're speaking about, you know, entities or about... Um, other energies uh there's there's many people that are that are known as channels or are known as as things like that and the energies are a much of a higher or a lighter vibration or a, oh. or of a consciousness sort of a field and then there's there's energies that are of a lower sort of um you know connotation and that 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 you know maybe um modern medicine is trying to medicate against and to to block out in a lot of um in a lot of cases so I have got some, some some tools and some different things that, that I use, but I'm not, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to sort of let the conversation flow and throw some things in. So I, I was hesitant to jump on. I thought, oh, yeah. this, could, this could go anywhere. But um, it's yeah. very interesting. As, as you said, Wendy, it's a very interesting topic and um, very different, you know. Yeah. Well, thank, thanks, Rami. I'm actually in, interested and, and curious to know what sort of tools you, you would be using well in, in general one, one of the things that we used to use um for for entities in general is usually if if um if we're going if we're going down this down this road and th this can actually help some people if it is if they have got something just of a general nature is that quite often um an entity can be stuck in a time or a job or a place so what you're doing is you're getting the getting the the energy or the entity or if you wish to call it that uh, to recognise who it is and who it was um, before that, and then you you keep following that energy and keep asking who it was before that and who it was before that and who it was before that, and then you you throw it back into the future again. And then who are you going to be in the in the future? And it it snaps that that entity out of believing that it's um, stuck in a certain time. And the mm -hmm. same thing with um, if they're in a certain job, you know, like the the um, Let's say that you know there is a, a, an entity that was you know grand, grandpa used to. He said he'd always look after little Johnny, and he was always going to be around and and help him. Now Johnny's had whispering in his ears for 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 all these years. The same thing can happen sometimes where you sort of say you know what's your job and what was your job before that and what was your job before and it, it can really be as simple as that or acknowledging um, that that the certain energy has done a good job and it can go home now. Thanks very much. You know, like thanks for your. Um, Thanks for your input, but um, I, you know I, I can keep moving on. And th th those tools are actually—I should preface—those tools are from um, the Access work, which is um, I think now called Access Consciousness. Um, oh. So I just thought I'd, I'll just pass that on, just because that's their sort of part of their stuff that they yeah, use. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> what I like. Oh, I like <clears throat> just getting feedback here. 
see if that's any better. Is that okay? Yeah, we can hear you clearly. Yeah, okay. I was getting feedback when I spoke with the phones on. Um, yeah, what I like about that, Raymond, is the acceptance of whatever the entity is an acceptance of the person no matter what and no matter what they choose to focus on it in that particular time. And I suppose what comes if we're, if we're talking about tools, um, I'm very mindful of that, that I've just come out of a, an intensive compassion conference <laughs> where we dedicated several days to focusing on compassion focused therapy. And uh, I suppose that is forefront of my mind right now, that in accepting the person's experience and accepting where they're at, it, that there's a certain degree of compassion that is required, or a large degree of compassion. Mm -hmm. and, and often people, I think, I think we're our greatest, uh, we're our greatest critics ourselves. We're probably far more lenient on other people than we are on ourselves. And so if we're having an experience that's not quite regarded as normal, that it's a bit out there and I can't talk to too many people about it, I think the tendency can be to be quite harsh on ourselves and to actually demonize ourselves that you wear this weirdo or having all this weird stuff going on and to isolate ourselves. But I, I love the way that you raise the different entities as being real <clears throat> and um, having well, their I, own sense of value, if you like. I, I, think, I think the word entity also brings up all sorts of connotations and all sorts of... Um, uh, things for m many people as well and, and um, over here we were in the comments was talking about you know your brain can create anything and and I'm not against that either because you know what if you know this has an entity being anything that's that's created and grown so whether it's being created from your brain and it is a living a living um, it's created a life for force of its own or whether it's it comes from some other reality that we're not uh, totally clear on it, it doesn't matter. It's something that is having an influence or a sway over who you are and, and what you're creating and what you're, you know, then becoming. So I, I think that, you know, having some tools or something to combat these things and to assist you, you know, rather than just having to be straight onto the medication or straight onto, and I'm not saying don't take medication either. I'm not an advocate of, of, of I, I'm an advocate of people and being true to their knowing and what is the greatest going to be the greatest outcome for their solution to to move forward? So you know, if you've got some tools to actually deal with these things, and 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 if we look at entity in the sense of you know a, an energy external to you that's got a life force, um, and and then that way you know you can you can then maybe start taking the information as good, bad, or whatever it is, and and you you then utilizing it for what you know what greater good you wish for or what you wish to do with it, you know. I would even throw into that, uh, including um, things like uh, split or multiple personalities a as a second or third entity, you know, that's not necessarily talking about some loopy spiritual, you know, um, ghost or anything. It, it, it can, an, a second entity could be created by yourself as a, as a split personality, perhaps. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. I was thinking that myself then. Um, and, and I suppose it makes sense to understand what we're talking about exactly when we say hearing voices that are external. Um, they're, they're external, well, they're hearing voices in the absence of any found external stimulus. And uh, research has actually shown, like um, PET and MRIs have actually shown the brain stimulation of auditory channels 
of people who do hear voices in the absence of an external source or an external stimulus. So the brain is activating as though it is very real. And yet I, I love that comment that the brain is capable of creating so many conditions and so many realities. And I believe that, you know, I personally believe that they're created for a reason or for a purpose that they're, that, that that purpose does deserve some greater inquiry rather than, as you said, Raymond, just medicating. And, and again, I'm not against medication either. It definitely has its place. However, I, I think I'm against medicating at the expense of denying the experience and exploring the experience for the sake of um, we, we don't need to go there because the medication will take care of it. I think that's where we're, we're denying what can be learnt from the experience and what the purpose of the voices are. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I think at the end of the day, it's really, you know, is something limiting to your life or is it expansive or, or what's it? what's it bringing and if if what you're you know what you're experiencing what you're hearing what you're is is having a detrimental effect on your life then you've got to look at it like this this is not something of growth for me and if if um you know it's it's got some element of growth then then where would you use it you know many writers and many different people have talked about how they have external influences when they actually um go to that space of of creating something new and you know they're almost like they move out of their bodies and they allow something something else to to take over and they they you know that's you know people I, I even know my brother writes that writes in a similar sort of a, a, a fashion so there's in that in that um, instance I would I would say that that's something of growth wouldn't you yeah yeah definitely and just before this uh, blab, I did a little research. I just looked up uh, people who have uh, been diagnosed, if you like, or recognised as hearing voices. And there's a there's a long, long list of them. And really? Some of, some of the greats, and I've just written down a few, but there, there were would have been over a hundred in. Um, I I checked out the Cardiff University website, and it has a specialty on he, uh, the Hearing Voices Network. Uh, so, and, and if anyone's interested, it's C Y M R U is the name of their website. So for Cardiff University, and I'm not sure what all the letters in between stand for. But some of the people, are just for interest's sake, like William James, the um, behavioural psychologist, Stephen Hawking, Martin Luther, Isaac Newton, Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Roosevelt, and they were in categories. So I just pulled a few, like the political mm -hmm. ones, Churchill, Lincoln, Roosevelt, artists, I just picked Van Gogh, uh, musicians, Leonard Cohen, Eric Clapton. So these were either diagnosed during their lifetime. Yeah, Einstein, Sylvia Platt, yes. Um, so these were diagnosed during their lifetime or post their death as being, um, uh, well, hearing voices, if you like, um, psychosis, psychotic people suffering with a form of uh, schizophrenia. Normally a psychosis and hearing voices is associated with schizophrenia. And I personally believe when that happens, um, there's, it, it usually relates, I, I think a lot of uh, differences in experience or, or intense is the word intense experiences relate to times in our lives that we haven't been able to process in other ways 
and so they it, it does deserve um, uh, paying attention to what's gone on in in your life and sometimes we're not even aware of it if it happened in early life and uh, I'm not an authority on pre-life you know in the conception and, and our our other lives but I do think that some of our intense emotions and episodes are connected with some very difficult experiences that have been in our lives. Yeah, no, definitely. While you were speaking, I was uh, actually just looking up the CYMRU. It turns out it's um, another word for Cambria, which is one of the four countries that make up the United Kingdom. Uh, yeah, uh, it, uh, it's Wales, isn't it, Cardiff? Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it might be a Welsh word mm. for Wales. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and also uh, it, I was curious to know of what the, the rates are of, um, of people hearing voices. And there are a few figures that were put forward, but basically figures from between four and 10% of the general population over the age of 18 are reported as hearing voices. So I thought that was pretty interesting because, you know, if, if we take the high figure, we're looking at around 10%. <laughs> mm. So that's not negligible. It's not an, un, you know, a, a greatly uncommon um, event in, in, according to those figures. Now, when they, when you, or when one speaks about voices, hearing voices, do, do they really uh, believe that they reside in their head or are they mistaken for external uh, voices like uh, someone in the room? Well, either. And I think like we've re re referred to hearing voices the whole time. Obviously that's the topic I put yeah. up. But psych, a psychotic event of this nature, like hearing voices, can also be any of the senses at all. So you, you feel touch. You feel that some people feel they've been touched. Some people see people. They experience them through our senses, whatever those senses might be. Um, and Mark says scientists have been able to make people hear voices by, yeah, okay. So by stimulating the auditory channels of our brains. Um, so yeah, I, I think the whole lot applies, Ben, in answer to your question, whether they are hearing voices, whether they believe that they're just voices in their head or they're they are people that reside somewhere that are talking to them uh, when they're not physically present. Right? Yeah. And, and along with all of those other sensory perceptions that I referred to. Often when uh, a couple have been together for a long time and, and one of them dies, um, they they say that they they can feel the, their presence and, you know, I um I can't help but think that this I've experienced this also but it's it's a familiarity of habit you know um like my partner has has gone away for a holiday or something and I'll and I'll go to think I'll still think that they're sitting beside me on the couch and I go to say something to them it's like oh they're not there that's right and I wonder if that um presence is really just a familiarity or a, a habit that's been broken and they're, and they're still sort of thinking oh yeah, I can feel their presence, that they're, they're really here with me. I mean, I, you know, I feel that when they're on holiday, so obviously that's not not like uh, someone from the other side that I'm feeling the presence of. And I wonder maybe if um, voices could also be um, experienced in that way, that uh, similarly that, you know, that I might find that I'm hearing that person speak to me when they're not there just through a, a habit of, of thinking um, or of, of hearing them. And, and I suppose uh, 
it, it all depends if we're talking about the person who's hearing the voices. The critical point here is if it's distressing for them or if it's comforting or reasonably okay for them. If, if it's reasonably okay and not a, a great distress, then there's probably little reason for concern uh, or need for treatment of any sort. It's, it's when experiences become distressings and um, so it may be in the form of hallucinations after a traumatic event that people replay or they, they continue to hear the screeches of the accident. And uh, in reference to, to your comment then, I, I do work with a lot of people following the death of a loved one. That's part of the work I do. And people commonly refer to a presence that they sense of their loved one in, it's, in various ways. It's very interesting because, you know, once that little red recording's on, you know, I don't think anyone's going to, to, to step too far over the... Um, over the line, but you know, there's many people that that will swear that they've heard voices that they would they would call as angels, or or you know they that they put in a different um, you know in a different way. And and in speaking about the death thing, I, I put in the comments earlier to um, I was speaking to uh, um, after Uncle Sam, and when my father, I'll just step out past the past the little red beep a little bit. <laughs> when my father um, passed, we spent. Uh, I can, I'll pause. Months. I'll press the no, pause. No no, 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 it's all right. It doesn't matter. I um, I'm, I, I look weird, but I think wildly. I look, I look, I look normal, but I think wildly, and, and a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> um, when when my my father passed, um, he was going through uh, cancer. We spent a lot of um, a lot of time with him, and and the whole family rallied with his uh, with his with his treatment. But I was very much there for a lot of what his sort of emotional support. I went to all of the um, oncology appointments. I went to all the different things and we were together for all of that part and we, we gained a, a very good communion or um, a connection. And when he was, when he was passing, he didn't um, um, wish to, uh, he, he was very funny. He didn't wish for all the family to be there. He wouldn't say it, but he, he was a very, very sort of, did things in his own in his own time, and every night in 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 his normal life, he would he had his same routine, and he'd watch his um he'd watch uh, uh, Wheel of Fortune and uh, different things, and then by the time uh, Current Affair came on or whatever the the news about halfway through that, he'd, he'd get up and he'd go off and he'd be washing the dishes or doing whatever. So we all left, and it just happened to be at that exact same time of the the evening, and I just had an awareness that you know he'd stick to his same <laughs> his same routine so I came back to to check on him and I saw my brother on the um on the uh on the return leg and he's my brother said no no he's still he's still fine I just I've just checked on him but that saying um I was uh, taken aback <laughs> is the only time that I can really 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 say that I really understood the meaning of that in totality because I walked into the um to the room where he was and I saw a young man i saw my father as a younger as a younger man and i actually turned to to call out to the nurses to to, to quickly come and then of course the brain and the analytical sides you know kicked in and I went, well that can't be and i looked back and that was his last because the moments between my brother and i passing were like nothing and i'd witnessed his his passing and and for me with a lot of the different things that i've looked into it was a little bit of a confirmation that there is more that there is a lot of other things um available and maybe some of them can't be explained with science as yet and and i and i am open to other possibilities but i'm not um i'm not here to say that you know because the the brain is such a ma magnificent wonderful thing and what it can do but also that there is other possibilities and other things that maybe we haven't even discovered yet, just as science is discovering new things, um, you know, almost daily, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. thank, thanks for sharing mm. that experience. That's, that's wonderful. Um, that, yeah, incredibly moving. 
Hello. Is Hello. it Jackie, Jacqueline? Is Jack it Jacqueline? Yeah, at Jacqueline. Now, would shall I? I might pause the recording because that might open it up to other things. What would you? Are you? Would you like it to be paused, Jacqueline? No. No. Okay. Okay. I'll leave it go then for the moment. <laughs> um, sometimes I don't know if people have some personal stuff they want to share or. Um, no, I don't. I don't mind. <laughs> okay. Fine. Yeah, it's up to you. Well, thanks for jumping in. Um, do you want to share something with us about the topic? Um, well, I really don't know much about like psychosis and hearing voices, but I do suffer from a mental illness. I have generalized anxiety disorder. So it's very, you know, um, I'm always in a state of like worry, always in a state of like anxiousness and fear, even though I'm intelligent enough to know that some of my fears are extremely irrational, it still doesn't make it easier, you know? It still doesn't help me understand it in a sense, especially when I'm having like one of my panic attacks. And um, I was just reading in the comments and, you know, I forgot the person's name. He was stating that, you know, well, people can do these things in, in, in the, the labs or whatever you want to call it. But, you know, it doesn't matter if people can do it. What matters is that these are affecting people, you know. People's lives are being affected by these situations, regardless of if it's, oh, you know, it's it could happen. Like, someone can make it happen. It's still, you know, something that's extremely uh, life-changing for people. So even if, you know, someone's hearing voices, it doesn't, you know, just because it can be done in a lab doesn't mean anything, you know. I feel like... Um, it's just very, it, it, it goes to show because I'm also a mental health advocate. So I believe that most of the time that when I do talk to people about mental health, they are very like, oh, well, you know, it's all in your head or like, oh, you're just a, like attention seeker or you're just, you know, um, stressed out. Everybody's stressed out. But the thing is, is that stress for different people, especially because of the serotonin levels dropping in somebody, it's extremely extremely different like I might be afraid of something and someone is afraid of the same thing but it's not as extreme for them like for me it'll be like a hundred times worse and I'm I know I'm intelligent enough to know that it's like over exaggerating but my body will still be like oh, okay but you know it's still danger danger you know and even though I know those things, it's my mind, you know, the chemical imbalance that's within my mind that messes me up. Mm. It's, well, you know, it's, sorry, Margaret, go, go ahead. I apologize. No, you, no, 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 you go. I was going to say though, you know, like I, I, I operate a little bit outside the box, Ashley, and, I, and the funny thing is I, I was wondering how many of those things that have been, you know, um, that are supposed to be, uh, limitations of yourself are actually talents and abilities that that have been not recognized because it really feels like you you are really uh, quite a perceptive person the fact that you even jumped on here and and you wish to speak about that and to sort of say hey listen you know just because you can create something in a lab doesn't mean that it's not happening for the person you know i i actually really wonder if you've if you've looked into you know maybe how aware that you possibly really are that you might be I, oversensitive, you know? Yeah, I've I've been told by a lot of people that I was born with two hearts. And it's funny because my favorite show is Doctor Who. And, you know, he has two hearts and all that stuff. But that I'm extremely empathic, that I'm extremely emotional, and that I can feel people's emotions. And it's like, at first, you know, I'm just like, I don't, I don't get it. Maybe it's just me being a child. You know, there's a lot of things in my past that, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, well, this is why, you know, these are the reasons why you are the way you are now. But when it comes to like things with the heart and emotions, I feel like that's something different. That's totally something, you know, that I can't explain and that people can't explain. And I feel because I'm so empathic, that it's a good thing and it's also an extremely bad thing because I don't know how to like deal like with that. it. Mm. So it does overwhelm me to like extreme moments where I'm literally like in a ball suffocating. For example, I live in, I live in New Jersey, so it's near New York city. And if I go to times square, I'm instantly like, 
feeling all types of things and it's so many emotions all at once and I'm just like oh my god like I need to focus on what I'm here for but it's really hard because I can one minute feel someone's sadness and then someone's happiness or someone's anger and I've been to therapists that have said you know well maybe it's like bipolar disorder but then it's like when it's me by myself I'm not like up and down I am perfectly in my emotional state of mind but when I am around certain people that I can feel their energies it's like I can also tell when they're my own emotions and when they're not like if I just get mad out of like somewhere and someone came into the room I'm just like that's a little weird. Like, is this someone's energy that I don't like? Their aura? Why am I so angry all of a sudden? And if that person were to leave, I would instantly be like, oh, I'm okay now. And it's just because of me personally that I do, you know, deal with a lot of this and I am a younger person. Um, I feel like our society needs to seriously be open-minded to these things. You know, they want to have science to back everything up. But the, the thing is, is that science can't back everything up, you know? And I feel like a lot of people need answers. So a lot of people will turn to, like, religion. They'll turn to science. But then there are certain things that are just, uh, be, you know, they just are. And I think people are afraid of the, that fact. And at times, I'm also afraid of that fact. I can't just be like happy that, you know, I have this and, you know, and people say, you know, medication is, is always the answer. And at times when I'm having an attack so bad, I would run to my Xanax pills, you know, but then I would like look at that bottle and it's like, you know, is this necessary? Is this important? Is this, can I, can't I fight this on my own? And I think, because people think, you know, modern medicine is so amazing and stuff, they think that these type of pills work. But in actuality, when I take a Xanax pill, I'm literally numb. I don't think, I don't, I'm not myself. I'm just in a state of like there. <laughs> and Shuts what happened? Down. Shuts yeah. your perceptions down. Yeah. And I mean, the thing is that it's, I can also still feel like my thoughts racing but it's like I'm kind of blocked inside of myself, so I can't express it outwardly, you know, but it's still in there. And I guess I just get so tired about it and so, like, you know, mellowed out that I just can't really do anything about it. And it'll take a few hours before I come back to who I am as a person. And I'm not, you know, here to say, you know, don't take pills because I'd be hypocritical because when I have extreme moments of anxiety – I need those pills, like, you know, and I don't want to say I need them, but sometimes in order to go through daily life, that's the only way I can do things. But I also believe that they do ruin, you know, who you are in a sense, like you can get lost in those medications. Mm -hmm. well, thanks so much for sharing all of that. Is it Ashley or Jacqueline? Uh, it's my middle name. So it's Ashley Jacqueline. Ah, oh, double barrel name, Ashley Jacqueline. Yeah. <laughs> AJ. Yeah. Um, I think you're very brave um, to come out and to be a mental health advocate uh, that can actually help so many others mm. by you sharing your story. And I'm so pleased that you, you so openly share it. And thank you so much for doing that. One thing I wanted to ask you, though, is... Um, like you referred to your Xanax pills, but what do you find, given that um, these labs are saved and they actually uh, are available through my webpage as well afterwards uh, so that others can get the benefit, I'm just wondering what helps you to get through your episodes of anxiety mm -hmm. and panic attack how do you, you without the xanax uh what else do you have well i there are these things called coping mechanisms um from therapists they'll tell you like to write things down and you know i wasn't i'm never the type to i'm not a writer so to me that was already like oh that feels like homework to me so i was <laughs> like i, I don't want to do that but then there are other things that i did like i um like there's these like points in the body I forget the word of it that, <laughs> I, <knew> that. <laughs> that I had to like 
practice doing but then I would also get like kind of like bored of it like I'm very I don't know I to me when I'm having an attack at that moment I want it fixed at that second you know and I need to know that it's not possible it takes time but when your heart is like palpitating at 100 miles per hour everything is shaking on you you kind of just want it to end you know but what I do is I honestly and you know it might sound cheesy to a lot of people but I think about the people that I love I think about what I'm trying to do and who I'm trying to be in this world, what I'm trying to achieve. And, you know, I have a lot of intrusive thoughts. I have a lot of thoughts that are irrational, that make no sense. And I just try to tell myself like, okay, why are you feeling this way? What is the reason why? Okay, you know, is, is it irrational? Does it make sense to you? And if it doesn't make sense to you, are you okay with the fact that it doesn't make sense? And most of the time, I don't like not knowing why I think the way I do. But, you know, the mind, is, it's a beautiful thing. But for people with the mental illness, it can also be a living hell in a sense because, you know, you're stuck. But I definitely know that if I think about my loved ones and trying to ground myself, telling myself I am here, I am here, you know, like what I'm feeling, this too shall pass. It will pass. I will not die, you know, from this. And you know, there have been cases of people actually having heart attacks, not very many, many, but cases of people actually having heart attacks because of the overstimulation of their body because of a panic attack. But, you know, I still try to have hope. And it's not even a religious situation. It's more of a spiritual thing. I know, you know, I'm an intelligent person when it comes to science, facts, and whatever the case may be. But I do know that there is something out there that I can't understand. And I am the way I am like this because of that fact. And it's a good and bad thing. Like I am very caring to people. And I think that's, if I didn't have this illness, I would not be so empathetic towards other people. I would not be kind and understanding. And I'm not judgmental because of it. And I wouldn't hurt other people the way other people take other people for granted. I, I don't, do those things. I'm very cautious about what I do, what I say. And um, so like I said, there's like a good and bad to it. So I really do try to think about the good moments of my life to get me out of like that cloud. Because like, that's what I consider my anxiety. It's like a cloud of darkness that tries to like cover my whole face. And it just blinds me and it makes whatever I'm trying to like think about like, not make any sense it, it becomes its own like Alice in Wonderland world and I'm falling through you know the hole and I just need to learn how to get out of it and you know, when, mm -hmm. you know you were talking before about you know sometimes when we were when I was asking you if there was the possibility that it could be a, a the, an element of talent and ability associated there and um, one of the things that I was thinking when I was just listening to you before was you know there's a tool called um, who does this belong to and it's not about finding out who the end person is, but it's recognizing that that some of those awarenesses and some of those things that you're picking up on aren't yours. And mm -hmm. like, you, like you were saying before, and if you if you sort of go, okay, so when you're in that situation, who does this belong to? And the other one is where does this come from? And it's not again about finding, you know, trying to find it, you know, pinpoint where it is. It's about the recognize if you even get slightly lighter, then it's not yours. And it's maybe to let go of some of those to be able to let go of some of those incoming awarenesses. They so go, oh, who's this belong to? And you're like, okay, that's not mine. You know, you can send that one, send that one on its way, send that one yeah. on and then and filter through to where you actually exist, you know, and, and what do I actually really perceive here and what would I actually like to create here, you know, because because you do um, you do matter and you are valuable. So that's the that's the point is finding out where where that stuff ends and where you start and where you can actually expand that that being you know yeah and like i'm you know reading the idea and stuff i've never you know i i hope i don't ever have psychosis you know because i've seen horrible things about it and i just think you know where i'm at i get scared of that because of you know the, the idea around it but i've never heard voices but i've felt things i have felt especially within like my heart like certain things like i'm a child of 9-11's terrorist attack and I had a nightmare prior the day before the attack happened of fire and buildings burning and my mother actually worked in the tower 
And she said that I was keeping her up all night because I was crying and screaming and I wasn't able to sleep because I just thought of death. So she didn't make it to work that time that day because of my nightmare. And, you know, I'm not saying, Hey, you know, I'm a psychic and stuff, but I do, you know, um, I do believe that there's something that kind of tells us, you know, certain situations, you know, and then, like I said, it might not be, you know, me hearing voices because I don't think I hear things, but I do feel things. Yeah. 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 I, Sorry. Not hurting. I think your experience is so, um, so so valid and so important for other people to hear as well that uh, like anxiety disorder is is quite common and i think your experience can be related to by people with not only anxiety disorder but other uncomfortable feelings that are beyond their control in the moment which may be hearing voices, you know. It, uh, I mm -hmm. think it, it doesn't really matter what the condition is. It's I don't feel I have control in this moment and it's a little bit scary for me. And so I think the way you've explained it um, is, is definitely relevant to the hearing voices conversation and mm -hmm. people can definitely, you know, pick up from that. I, and, yeah, I, whilst you say you may not be psychic, you are obviously gifted in certain ways. And I think you recognise that, which is a really, really good thing, that um, because you did say you are prepared to take the good with the bad, you know, there's some good aspects and some bad aspects. And I love the way that you actually... Um, your coping, one of your coping mechanisms is to tune in to the things and the people you love. And I think that's enormous benefit, um, you know, obviously for you, but others can, can gain from that. So, yeah, just want to thank you so much for, yeah, sharing so openly your experience. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, it's it's not easy, especially because of my age. A lot of people don't think I have enough credibility because I'm such a young person. But I've always been How told. How old are you? Um, I'm 25, but I mean 24. But I've been, you know, um, raising awareness ever since I like learned myself what is going on with me. Like my family wasn't really like um, understanding of it, so I had to do my own research on what I possibly had and I stood up for myself and I think that's the thing that I know so many people are unable to do is you know stand up for themselves or even speak out because it's such a difficult thing to do so it, it's it's not easy for me either but I know that if I talk about it then maybe I could help somebody else and helping somebody else also heals me in a sense and it's not like you know I don't have fun talking about it because it's extremely hard, you know, and a lot of people will judge you based off of that one thing. They won't want to know that I've graduated with a degree, you know, that I have a job, you know, like all of these things, they won't really want to know who you are as a person. If you just tell them, hey, you know, I have a mental illness, the instant thing they'll think of is a murderer and a crazy person who's not intelligent. That's and it's what like, I, I don't, when I saw I, you, straight away, I thought murderer. But I don't understand how, like, those are, like, the three main things people will connect us with. And, of course, you know, Hollywood and the media has a lot to do with it and people's ignorance. But it's like, you know, first of all, there's a proven fact, and it's fact, stating that if someone has a mental illness, they would be the victim first. They would never hurt anybody else. They would hurt themselves first. And death by suicide is one of the, you know, it's a huge thing. And also when it comes to being crazy, most of the intelligent people in this world, you can look back, like you were stating before, you know, naming all those people. Most of those people had some type of illness, had some type of, you know, as people would say, crazy tendency. But that's what made them intelligent because they thought beyond what was there. They didn't really try to stick with what other people wanted, you know. And I just, I mean, and personally and myself, like I just hate that because I feel like I always have to fight that. I always have to fight to people like, yeah, you know, I have a mental illness, but, you know, where I rather want to be like, I have a mental illness and 
Mm-hmm. I am a college graduate and, you know, I've, I'm, I'm working with kids, you know, doing a photo series on anxiety disorders and, you know, I love fashion and I love ice cream, you know, just all those things that people would not really want to get to know about you because they only hear that one thing. There is a, a stigma associated with mental health issues, and it is from the past history, isn't it? You know, we've we've mistreated people with mental health problems in the past, and uh, today we tend to think it's just a, you know, come on, get, get over it, uh, chin up, and uh, just look on the bright side, and you know, all, you hear all those sorts of things yeah. as if it's just. <laughs> You know, it's just that, you know, you're, you're just thinking cor- incorrectly, just snap out of it and you'll be fine. I've heard when people re- tell me, I'm sorry, keep going, keep going. I was just going to say when really we should be, be looking at it as if it, it's a, phys- you know, just like breaking your arm, you know, you can't just say, Hey, get on, you know, just, what are you doing? Chin up, just go on, back. Put your on, get back to work. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a serious problem. And once I think once we acknowledge that mental health issues are just as important, if not more important, because they're often invisible um that as important as physical health problems that you know we need to apply the same amount of dedication and seriousness to to solving um helping people with mental health problems as just as we do with physical health problems yeah most definitely then and hence the reason for the topic to bring mental health in, into the open arena and uh, I just got news of yet another young person committing suicide this morning, someone known to me and I, I get to the point where I think why are we not paying attention to this? Like this is in, in my personal world, this is a knowledge of four people in the last month, say, just people I know. And and I'm thinking that we pay so much attention and fear to terrorism and we've got suicide happening under our very noses every single day. And I'm thinking, where's the attention? Why are we, okay, so we have a mental health day specialty which is the focus of our spiritual conversations this week. But where is, you know, the attention it deserves? Are we going to keep losing people? It, it is, suicide is the, the highest um, out of death by suicide is higher than any, by any other external causes. Sorry, I'm just laughing at uh, Daniel down there. I, I, I shook my family tree and a bunch of nuts fell out. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so I, that might be a good note for us to begin to wind up on because um, we've gone for a bit over the hour now and I don't like to blab all day long. <laughs> um so before we do close off, I want to thank you all for contributing and the people in the room on the side as well. Your comments have been amazing. I'm sorry I haven't personally got to them, but I've, I know that people have. And um, thank you so much. And for the people in the room here, the four, the three of you, <laughs> thanks so much. And if you just go around and tell us a bit about who you are, how people can get in touch, if they want to follow up in any way, that would be great. So if we go around the boxes, maybe starting with Vin. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Um, it's been an enjoyable uh, but serious blab. Um, I am Vin, or otherwise known as Vintuitive, and you can find me at Vintuitive.com or on Twitter as Vintuitive or everywhere else under that same name. I am a web developer and a promoter and a keen blabber, so you can uh, view some of my blabs on my live streaming page at Vintuitive.com. Thanks, Vin. And Ashley Jacklin? Uh, yeah, so I don't really blab that much. Um, I've kind of like stopped doing that because I'm actually doing um, a photo series with the shoe brand Keds. I won a competition. So what my focus basically on right now is 
photographing people with anxiety disorders. And um, it's going to be done in November. So I'm going to have it posted on my blog site. But where people usually could find me is my Instagram account, which is Jacqueline, my name, but it's Jacqueline.loon. So there's like a period in between Jacqueline and Loon. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm also a fashionista, photographer, uh, anthropologist, and a mental health advocate. And I talk a lot about on my blog, um, JacquelineLoon.com. I talk a lot about um, mental health, lifestyle, you know, just fun things. Like I want to show the world that, you know, just because I have a mental illness doesn't mean I need to be depressed. Just because I have a mental illness that I can't be a typical 24-year-old girl. Um, I'm also, you know, I work with a lot of other companies, uh, brands to like help them raise awareness with clothing and stuff like that. So that's, that's just basically what I do. Wow. Thanks so much. Sounds like you've achieved an enormous lot in your 24 years. Uh, I'm going to do it all. That's for sure. I'm going to make sure that I keep doing what I need to do. Yeah. You haven't been idle at all. <laughs> I can... Yeah. Just firstly, can I just preface with saying that, you know, um, that you, you you a few times spoke about um, how young you know how young you are and I, I don't see that at all you know because I just saw an amazing person that's that's growing that's got a lot of gifts that you know you're just working where they all fit so um, I, I, I'm going to keep an eye on you you're, you're you're all wonderful that was great to hear from you today so thanks very much Thank um, you. but I'm um, a consciousness um, initiator I suppose cultivator propagator. I uh, started in horticulture, so anything to do with, with that sort of stuff. Maybe I'm even a farmer. Who knows? Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, at the moment I'm, I've got the More You magazine and I've also um, – uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm also, you know, sorting a few things out, which I'm doing very slightly and steadily with, where you can actually get a hold of me a bit easier. But uh, Twitter's probably the best the best place just for now. And, um, yeah, and, and to anyone that was on, I know that um, Lane was – for the for the blab this morning, I apologise. There was a there was a bit of a mishap with um, myself and Jason, and um, then the the blab actually kicked us out by kicked me out by accident. So I uh, apologise to anyone that was there. <laughs> yeah, I've had that happen too, uh, Raymond. The idea is to grab someone as the co-host <laughs> to hold <Yes>. the seat. <laughs> I've learnt yeah. that one by getting kicked off twice. <laughs> so I'm Margaret Lambert, psychologist, author and speaker, and I my focus is on holistic health and healing and the importance of your life story in healing conditions because I think the life story gets left off part of the health regime when we approach holistic healing. We do all the other stuff and we forget about paying attention to our life experiences that often need healing. And I can be found on margaretlambert.com. That's my web page. And my blabs, I host this spiritual conversations the same time each week. So there'll be another one next Friday, of which I haven't um, got a topic <laughs> to announce just yet, but it will be very soon. And I also uh, host Wellbeing Weekly Blab on Wednesdays at the same time, around the same time as well. So that's around midday in our part of the world, down under. Darwin time, Adelaide time. So love to have you join. And I I am an EFT, Ashley, Jacqueline, you referred to, to this one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an EFT practitioner and trainer. <laughs> and I love the energy therapy because I've seen so many great results with it. So I do Periscope on chronic fatigue syndrome uh, on a Monday and chronic pain and EFT, tapping, tap for well-being on a Tuesday on Periscope. So they're my sessions. So, and, yeah, thanks, Ben, for putting them in. You can catch yeah, it on my web page at live streaming. The times are there. So thank you, everyone, and particularly Ashley, Jacqueline, and, and Raymond, because you both shared some personal experiences, which I think is very courageous and it's wonderful for people to actually relate personally. I think that gives a whole different perspective on what may be just a, a 
a blab talking around the topic to actually get right into it. It makes a world of difference when people share experiences. So thank you so much. Thanks so for having us. Next, next um, blab. So bye for now.